Hello everyone, I'm Robin, the Red River Historian. For over 20 years, I've been researching, writing, and sharing the history of the Red River Valley in Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma, and Texas, where the South meets the West, through my website, redriverhistorian.com. I am dedicated to preserving our region's unique contributions, and to do so, I consult with museums, civic, and educational institutions in exhibit design, research, programming, content, archiving, writing, and publishing. Today's web lesson concerns how to document the research journey. The work product created in a museum program should become a part of your museum's collection as well as your own personal portfolio. This web lesson explains how you can do this effectively using the tools you already have. Let's start with an inventory of your current programming. There tends to be an idea in museums that only certain positions create lasting work products. And once the work is completed, the information contained in the program, exhibit, or tour becomes almost sacrosanct and questioning isn't exactly welcomed. But here's the kicker. Often I've been told that the information in a program is inside someone's head. It's not documented anywhere. Thus, the program is based on information that cannot necessarily be gathered again. This is not healthy for the continued success of your museum. Let me explain. Being insular in your programming is not a dynamic way to run a museum. Museums should not be run as static places where only one or two people are acknowledged as experts. The invaluable collections in your museum are too unique not to be shared widely and interpreted deeply. Considering how many more sources are being unearthed almost constantly, it's a grave injustice to your museum's interpretation not to continuously refine it. This is also not a way to be productive in your museum. If the museum staff or volunteers have to reinvent the wheel with their own research instead of using an archive of sources already outlined, then the stories of a, that a museum wants to tell cannot move forward. The museum ends up telling the same tales over and over again with some details lost over time and some details changed. The story itself becomes inauthentic. This is also not a way to show value to your staff and volunteers. If they cannot have a stake in your museum's programming, they won't see a return on their investment of time. Staff who can't contribute may become disinterested or even worse, disenchanted. This dynamic will eventually funnel to your visitors as well. To their eyes, the museum is the same old, same old and will become stale. This is why I suggest that to run a museum professionally, one has to adhere to two main social scientific methods, replication and reflexivity. All work that is done should have the ability to be replicated by any other member of the museum staff. To do this, research must be documented. Replication means that the research should be reproducible. As the researcher moves along in her work, she should be reflexive about her journey. This means she may draw new insights or may interpret them differently. The research process should thus be documented through a journal that explains what new information or new ways of thinking the journey uncovered. For replication to be successful, a museum staffer should be able to use the research documented by other museum staffers. That's not always possible, however, as some museums have not made the documentation of research a consistent habit. But here's where you can start. For every program, exhibit, tour, or whatever you're doing, begin documenting the sources by creating an archive for each project. You might start with two folders, one virtual for your computer and one physical for your desk. Name them the same. The virtual folder will contain all the sources you compiled from the internet, from the Library of Congress, from other sources, what have you. These sources should be documented and labeled thoroughly. They should be transcribed or saved as PDF or picture files like JPEGs and so forth. Each item should be saved with a descriptive identifier that links it to the folder's name so it's easily retrievable. The physical folder will contain all sources used that you have physical access to, such as copies made for microfiche records, newspaper clippings, photographs, and more. If possible, the original document that you use should be photocopied and placed inside the folder and identified through a system that reflects the folder's name. Using this method, 
Every museum staffer will be able to build on the research already completed. It's a win-win. But how you've interpreted the research is unique to you. When other staffers look at the documentation, they need to understand what you deemed important and how you drew the conclusions that you did. This is the crux of the method called reflexivity. A journal that documents your research journey must become part of your archive. This journal can be a diary that you handwrite and eventually place in your physical project folder or a digital document that you can add and save for in your virtual project folder. Whatever the format, the journal should reflect how you derived at the research. This journal should be updated whenever research is done, and you should write in full sentences too. Think of the following questions as you write your journal. Where did you find the sources? How did you find the source? What did you find in the source? What were you expecting to find? What conclusions did you draw? How will you want to use this information? What information are you lacking? By completing a journal to explain your research journey, others will be able to replicate your research by retracing your steps. But even more importantly, you are creating a lasting legacy of interpretation for your museum your work product becomes a part of the museum's history. The work product you create should be part of your museum's archival collection as it reflects the information and work your museum was responsible for during a specific time frame. By using the social scientific methods of replication and reflexivity, the research process is documented and the work product is archived, allowing other staffers to document their own work as well. It's a cycle that tells a lot more. The research itself is part of the exhibit. Here's an example from my own experience. To commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day, the successful invasion into mainland Europe in the summer of 1944, I created an exhibit that sought to identify the men in this iconic photograph that you see on the screen right here. I had thought that other museums, or at least the National Archive where this photograph is held, had already identified a number of the men. The Library of Congress even lists some of their names. Therefore, I thought the exhibit information would simply consist of me piggybacking off of authoritative individuals. But I was wrong. No one had ever done the research on who these men were. The names listed by the Library of Congress were just based on letters from family members purporting that their fathers or uncles had been there. Several World War II veterans themselves claimed to be in the photographs, while others specifically mention a few others. There was only one author who was able to identify a number of the men, but only a few of his names matched those listed by the Library of Congress. I learned that there was only one truly verified soldier standing with Dwight Eisenhower, this guy right here. The others were just guesses. What was I to do? I decided that the exhibit would continue, but it would not pretend to be an authority. Instead, I would name all of the men I found who were claimed or claimed themselves to be in the photograph. I wrote my decision in my journal. I concluded that it was not my job to ferret out who was there and who wasn't. First, it was impossible, and second, what point would that serve? I decided to list all of the men who claimed to be someone in the photograph instead. My exhibit thus looked at nine figures, but gave information on 22 men. All men served in World War II, and all of the men were paratroopers who landed on the beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944. They all deserved to have their stories heard. The photograph thus served not as the main focus of the exhibit, but a catalyst to tell veteran stories. Because I documented my research sources, as well as my research journey that led to the focus of the exhibit, subsequent museum staffers can use this archive to replicate and even enhance a possible future exhibit. They may come across sources I hadn't found, and they can build on this. By applying two methods of social scientific research, replication and reflexivity, your museum can be dynamic, interpretive, and your constituents will appreciate it. It's no longer stale. This methodology can be applied to all sorts of research endeavors, learning an old piece of music, demonstrating historic skill, figuring out where the outhouses were inside your neighborhood, discovering the purposes of found objects on the site, learning the story behind a photograph, 
like I did, and a lot more. And this is the gist of documenting your own journey. You recognize that it's important to share with others so that you can learn from their journey and they can learn from your journey. But you will also see that this documentation helps to create a portfolio of your work that you can share as a museum professional. Thank you for watching this short web lesson. This web lesson serves as a glimpse of what you can do with the right tools or what I can expand upon if you decide to hire the Red River Historian for this kind of work. I can assist you in building programs, exhibits, and publishing projects for your institution very economically and very knowledgeably as I have a firm foundation in our regional history. Visit my website to learn more of what I can provide for you at www.redriverhistorian.com. If you'd like to learn more and talk with me, please email me. I'm at robin at redriverhistorian.com. See you at the next web lesson.